And let us turn to Romans chapter 7. We're continuing our uh, sermon series in the book of Romans. I hope it's been helpful and profitable for you. It has been for me to go through these verses again. So turn to Romans chapter 7. We'll be there in verses 1 through 6 this morning. Talking about serving in newness of the Spirit. I wonder if you have had thoughts like this in your mind and heart, that I really want to overcome sin. I mean, I really, I want to live right. I want to live for the Lord. I want to be pleasing to God. But the pull of sin is so strong. That that pull that the temptations of, of, of life just, they plague me, and I don't like it, and I want to serve God. How can I be free? How can I, how can I serve God the way that I really want to serve God? And I think that arming ourselves with the knowledge that God has given us through His Word and especially here in Romans chapter 7, can really help us tremendously to live a life to God like we want to live. And as we get into Romans 7, this is not a totally new section. Uh, Sometimes it appears to us that Paul is changing the subject from what he has been talking about, but really he's just continuing along the same line of thought that he's been establishing. Um, And really, he's picking up on something in chapter 6 in verse 14 that he said. Flip back there and take a look at 614. He had said, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Isn't that what we need? That, That sin would no longer master me anymore? Isn't that what we want in life? And you see the ground for that. You see how that has to happen at the end of verse 14. He says, notice, sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That's that's the key, that we have to move out from under law. We have to move out from under the law of God. And I know that probably sounds strange to your ears. We have to be moved into the realm of grace. And it's only at that point that we can be freed from sin, that sin would not master us anymore. Well, how can this happen? When when did this happen? That is the subject of Romans chapter 7 that we have died to the law. And the truth is that uh, you and I, all of mankind, has great trouble with the law. I'm talking about the law of God. I'm talking about the law that God says, I want you to live this way. This is what is right. This is what is good. This is how I want you to live. Whether we're talking about the old covenant law, the law of Moses, or whatever it may be, God has standards for how He wants us to live. And we have trouble with that. Now, is is the problem with the law of God? Is there something wrong with the law of God? No, 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 that's not the case. The law of God is perfect and holy and right and good. And it's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. The problem is with us. Because of our weakness and our sinfulness, we can't live up to God's demands. We can't live up to what God wants us to be. We fail miserably. And so we have really a great problem with the law. And Paul has been saying this all along. In fact, if you flip back with me again to Romans chapter 1, the great theme of the book of Romans in verses 16 and 17. What had Paul said there? Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that is, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Righteousness does not come through the law. It does not come through works of the law, our ability to keep the law. It only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ and faith in the gospel of Christ. This is his whole argument that he's been making. Uh, flip over with me to chapter 2. Look again at verse 13. Paul wrote there, For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. It's not enough to hear the law. It's not enough to know the law of God. You have to be a doer of the law. And here's the catch. Here's why we have such a problem. You and I, we have to do it perfectly. In order to be justified by law, you have to be perfect, flawless, without one sin on your account. Now, who wants to go up against that? Who of us could say, well, I want to be justified by law? It's not going to happen because of our weakness, because of our sinfulness. Look at uh, Romans 3, verse 19. Again, Paul is showing us we, we have a problem here. We need to be set free from the law. Romans 3, 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. You know what the law does? It shuts every mouth. The law, he says, shuts every mouth and the whole world becomes accountable to God. Guilty in the eyes of God. Look at verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Mark that well in your mind. Because of the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. No one. It is not possible to live up to the law's demands. Come over with me to chapter 3 and verse 28. Paul said there that we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Come down to chapter 5 and verse 20. Again, again, I'm just showing you that we have a problem here. Chapter 5 and verse 20. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The law came in so that transgression would increase? You see, the law shows us our sinfulness. The law shows us what utter failures we are. So there has to be a way that we can come out from under the law. And that's what Paul begins to tell us in Romans 7, starting in verse 1. And by the way, just on the side, don't you think that Paul's uh, teaching that we just, just did an overview of, don't you think that made the ears of Jewish people just burn? Because, because they, they love the law of God. And we do too, don't we? They love the law of God, and they thought, by my keeping the law, I'm, I'm going to be justified before God. And they knew that the law was glorious and beautiful and wonderful, and it is. And it burns our ears today, even. And people will say, well, you can't say that. You can't say that we're not under law. Well, Paul said that. Romans six fourteen: sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. And it has to be that way in order for us to be pleasing to the Lord. Paul said in, in Galatians 3, verse 10, let me read this to you. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. And so, yes, the law of God is glorious and wonderful. But to live under the law is to live under a curse because we can't live up to it. So what are we going to do? What is the solution 
to this problem. And honestly, it makes me, uh, you know, a little bit nervous to preach a lesson like this, and I've preached several of them lately, because you don't want people to misunderstand. And that's, that's what Paul was saying, too. I, I don't want you to misunderstand. It's, it's not that the law of God is bad. It's not that there's something wrong with the law of God. The problem is with us. And he didn't want people to misunderstand and say, well, if we're not under law, then I just have a license to sin. I can just live however I want to live. And Paul would say, no, that's an abominable idea. That's not what I mean. Some would say that, Paul, are you, are you nullifying the law of God? Are you denigrating the law of God? And Paul dealt with that. He said, we don't nullify the law, but we establish, we uphold the law. We put the law in its rightful place, giving it its rightful honor. And so the clear truth is that we do have a problem with the law. So what do we do? Look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 1. Let's talk about our death to the law. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? How long does the law, the, does the law have authority or jurisdiction over a person? Well, it's as long as they're alive. You know what you never hear? I don't think I've ever heard this. Of someone getting a speeding ticket who's been long dead? EJ, has that ever happened? No. Uh, because that person is gone. They're dead. They're free from, from the laws of the land. So we understand that. Uh, verse 2 For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. Paul here begins an analogy with marriage. And he says, basically, it's, it's like marriage. How long is a wife bound to her husband? He says, as long as her husband is alive, she is bound by that law of marriage to her husband. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. Look at verse 3. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. The wife cannot be joined to another unless the husband dies. And death is what severs that marriage bond. Now keep in mind that Paul is not giving here an exhaustive teaching about marriage and divorce and remarriage. He's trying to make a point, but there are other teachings we could look at, like Matthew 19, which talks about fornication being a reason for a, 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 a divorce and a remarriage to be allowed to happen. We could look at 1 Corinthians 7, where an uh, unbeliever abandons the believing person. But he's not trying to give an exhaustive teaching. I think this is where we get confused. We look at this and we say, why, why is Paul talking about marriage all of a sudden? Uh, well, that's, that's only uh, an analogy that he's using to get us to see a larger point. And what is his point? Look at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. There's his point. He says to the church, he says to you and I, do you know what happened to you? You were made to die to the law. Well, why? Because we had to be removed from law and moved under the realm, under the sphere of grace. And so a death had to happen. You get this interesting insight into the spiritual world and spiritual laws. There had to be a death before we could be transferred out of that union into the realm of grace. And so, notice that the law, it's not the law that died, right? He says, you died. You died to the law. The law of God is still alive and well, but you died to the law. Now, when did that happen? How did that happen that we died? You remember what he was saying all through chapter 6. What happened to you when you were baptized into Christ? 
You died with Christ. You, you, you were crucified with Christ. You died to sin at that moment that you came in faith. Trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus, you were immersed into the water, you were brought back up out of the water. There was a spiritual change that really happened at that moment, and you died to sin, but not only that, you died to the law. Died to the law. What do you think about that? We, we, have, to, we have to grasp the magnitude of that. Because I've died to the law. What do you say to that? Thank God. Thank God for that. Thank God. Praise God that I'm no longer under a curse. I'm no longer under this obligation to keep this law of God, which I was never able to keep. I've been freed from that. I've died to that. I'm in the realm of grace now. And sin is no longer charged to my account now. Sin can no longer come in into my life and enslave me because sin, you know what it does. It takes opportunity through the law. The law says don't do that and sin comes in and says you should do that. And it, it, it works on us through the law of God and it enslaves us through the law because of our weakness. Paul says down in verse 8 that sin is dead apart from the law. So thank God that we've been released. We've been freed from that. And I, I want to serve God. I want to live to God, but I just keep falling into sin. I just keep pulled in, getting pulled into temptation. But what if we realize what has happened to us, that we've died and we've been removed out of the realm of law into the realm of grace? Well, Let's look a little deeper. Why? Why did God, through Christ, have us to die to the law? He gives us three reasons here that we'll look at. Look again at, uh, at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Why did we have to die to the law? It's so that we could be joined to another. It's so that we could be joined to Christ. And what do we say about that? That we've been joined to Christ. Thank God. Praise God. We've been joined, actually joined to Christ. And because we've been joined to Him, we're sharing in His life. We're sharing in His love. We're sharing in His light. We're sharing in His nature. And we have this freedom from sin. Maybe we haven't realized it, but because we've died to the law and we've died to sin, we have freedom from that now. We're sharing in, in Christ's freedom from death. We don't have to fear death anymore because we've been joined to Christ. Praise God for that. And because we've been joined to Christ, we're abiding in Him and He's abiding in us. We're one with Him. Well, how did that happen? Only because we died to the law and we've been transferred over to Christ. It happened when you were baptized into Christ. Why, why did we have to die to the law? He says at the end of verse 4, look with me again, in order that we might bear fruit to God, for God. We died to the law so that we might bear fruit. You know, there is no bearing of fruit to the Lord while you're under law. That, that We have to be separated from that because our sinful passions are aroused by the law. The sinful passions work in our body and they, they bear fruit for death. I think of it this way, just to give you a mental picture, a mental image. If you pictured yourself as a tree... Before you came to Christ, what kind of tree would you be? Well, a doughty old rotten black tree with stinking rotten fruit. Because we were bearing fruit for death, he says. That's what we were producing for God. It, despite our best efforts, despite our desire to please God. But now that we've been joined to Christ, having died to the law, what kind of tree are you? 
Oh, you're a beautiful, healthy, fruit-bearing tree planted by the water, yielding fruit for God. What kind of fruit are we talking about? Good works are flowing out of our lives that are pleasing now to God because we've died to the law. You're a tree that's, that's yielding this love and joy and peace and patience and all those fruits of the Spirit. And you're this tree that is healthy and, and you're reaching out and blessing others with good works and with love and with patience and you're affecting those around you. And God is pleased with that now. Why? Because you've died to the law and been joined to Christ. We had to die to the law first. And, and look at the third reason. Why have we died to the law? Look at verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Oh, don't you love that? We can now serve in newness of the Spirit, not in oldness of the letter. He's talking about the letter of the law, those, those letters that were engraved on stone, those letters that said, you must do this or you will die. And we couldn't live up to it. You know, we've been released from that. And now what do we do? We can serve in newness of the Spirit. You died to law in order that you might serve God as a slave. We haven't died to the law, see, in order that I can just have a license to sin. We haven't died to the law so that I can go live my life however I please, apart from God. That's not the purpose, and I know that's not what we want. We want to serve God. And the word there is to serve Him as a slave. And, you know, someone might, might kind of balk at that. Well, I don't, I don't know that I want to be a slave. Well, the fact is you're going to be a slave either of sin or, or to God. I want to be a slave to God. I want to be a slave to God. That's exactly where I want to be. I, I want to be a slave to my loving Father who loves me and cares for me and accepts me because of Christ and who always has my best interest at heart. I want to be His slave. And I want to serve Him. And I want to serve others. That's what I want to do with my newfound freedom from law. I want to serve. Do you want to serve? You want to serve God? You want to serve your brethren? You want to serve those around you in your life? And how do we serve? Not in oldness of the letter. Not according to some cold, unforgiving legal code. As beautiful and wonderful as it is. But we serve in newness of the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of God is now empowering our service to God. The Spirit of God is causing us to be obedient to God from the heart. Not because I'm, I'm checking the boxes or trying to live up to this code, but it's because I've been united to Christ and I love Him and I appreciate Him and I want to serve Him. That's what the Spirit now is creating in us. Obedience to God from the heart. The laws of God written by the Spirit of God on my heart. We've been given a Spirit that has given us the desire to walk with God. Who's changing our desires. Who's changing us from the inside out. With the knowledge that yes, I'm still a sinner. And yes, sin still pulls at me and sin still tempts me. But because of the work of Christ on the cross, because I died to the law when I was baptized into Him, I can fulfill the intent of the law's demands. I can, I can serve God and God is completely happy with me and, and He accepts me in Christ Jesus even though I don't keep His law perfectly. 
But I'm trying, Lord, I'm trying to serve you, but I know I fall short. And God says, you know what? You are okay with me. We are okay. We have peace with one another. I know you're not perfect, but again, you've been released from the law. I think of it this way. Think about your relationship with your children, if you have children. And the fact that your children don't always do what's right, do they? Well, I didn't either as a kid. Or now. But think about your children and, and the fact that if they're wanting to please you, they're wanting to do what's right, they want to follow your instructions, but they just mess it up sometimes, as we all do. Well, how do you look at your children in those instances? Hey, they're okay with me. There's nothing between us. That You're my child, and I love you, and I know you mess up a lot of times, but, but I know you're trying, and I know you love me, and I, that's how God looks at you and me. But when we're under the law, that can't happen because the law says you sin and you die, and there is no mercy, there is no forgiveness. We had to be released from that. And because we have been, now we can serve God through the Spirit of God and be pleasing to God and bear fruit for God that He accepts and that He, he loves and He enjoys and He looks at us with love in His heart. So I want to ask you this morning, have you died to the law? If you've been baptized into Christ, you've come to Him in faith and been immersed into Jesus, you have died to the law, whether you knew that happened or not. That's what happened. Have you, uh, have you realized what happened to you, that you died to the law and were joined to another? And, and are you bearing fruit for God this morning? When you look at your life, is your life filled with good deeds for others? Is it filled with those fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, and patience, gentleness, kindness, all of those things? Is it flowing out of your life? But if you're still operating under the principle of law in your relationship to God, those things don't flow. You've got to die to the law before you can bear fruit to God. And are you serving in newness of the Spirit? What does that look like? Concerning your service to God, are you operating on a principle of I have to or I want to? I think that's a good question to ask ourselves. See, that tells you whether it's coming from the heart or not. I have to do this, I have to do that, God is going to be angry, God is going to strike me, or is it rather, I want to serve God because I love Him and because He set me free, and I want to obey Him. So in your worship, is it because I have to or because I want to? In your prayer life, is it because I have to or I want to? Because when the Spirit of God is in us, it's a it's a change of heart. I want to serve Him. Your study, I have to or I want to? Are you allowing the Spirit of God to change your desires and to change your heart? And so I invite you this morning that if you have not died to the law, would you consider doing that, putting your faith in Christ so that He can justify you and make you righteous? Would you come to Him in faith and be united with Him? Would you put them on in baptism? If we can help you with that, we would love to help you in any way that we can. If you need prayers this morning, we would love to pray with you. If there's any need that you have, please come while we stand and sing.